So if you've heard or read anything about Hopper in the last year, it's probably about us raising money, crazy valuation, hiring, growth, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it is true that uh, during the pandemic, since the pandemic hit, we closed four fundraising rounds, um, and we've had a very different trajectory than almost every other travel company um, in that we doubled our revenue during COVID. And of course, we didn't do this because we had more customers. We had just as little customers as everybody else. We did this because we got really deep into financial ancillaries, fintech. So I thought it would be cool to come on stage and show you guys how we did it. So maybe some of you can do the same thing and get some of the benefits out of it. Let's start with this. So fintech and travel, another stupid buzzword. Um, the way we define it is we include payments, so anything that has to do with facilitating payment, um, but we also include anything that is a risk-based product that protects the customer against something, which we think is the most interesting segment there. So I'll do a quick walkthrough. We like to divide the whole travel fintech space into three buckets. This is pre-purchase. So we started with price predictions. Um, there's a couple of companies that do something similar. Um, actually, Steve is right there. Kayak has been doing it even before us. They have this cool product. Google has some of this. I kind of feel their heart's not in it, like given the amount of tech they have. <laughs> but, you know, um, and there's one company that does it in hotels. We've been doing this forever. Um, one thing we do, which I think we are the only ones to do, is that we underwrite our forecasts. So if we say buy and you book and the price goes down, we give you the difference. Um, so that's a form of risk pool. The one that is the most interesting is price freeze. Um, so there's a bunch of airlines, and there's one company um, in India that has been doing this. They're basically locking a fare for a few days. Um, so we started this a couple years ago. At Hopper, you can put money down on a flight, but also a hotel room, let's say 40 bucks. And if the price goes down, you pay the lower. If the price goes up, we pay the difference. We remit in full to the airline, even if it's $10,000. This price freeze product, one out of four of every hotel room or every flight ticket we sell is previously frozen. It's a massive mainstream appeal, and it's driving about a third of our revenue right now. The pre-purchase stuff is cool because mounting loss, people put some money down, and then after that, the likelihood they'll come and buy on your platform is way higher. Then you hit the protection products. Um, so one of the most popular ones right now, surprisingly, is misconnection and delays. The way we do it um, in the Hopper app, if you miss um, your connection because the airline is late for an hour, um, you open up the app, every single flight on any airline leaving the airport you're in is free, you tap and you board. Um, so that's one of our super popular products. Surprisingly, very little competition there. Kiwi's been doing it for a while. Um, and then AirHelp actually does a weird like post-booking, get the money back from the airline out of Europe. Um, another one that's really interesting is cancel and change for any reason. So we actually have those on hotels now, which is super interesting. Um, there's a couple companies that have been doing it, um, you know, Trip.com, which is C-Trip, Traveloka. Travel Fusion actually built a really good product for this. Um, those are really cool because they let um, customers buy just the flexibility or the cancelability without subscribing to a full insurance product. And then you get into next-gen insurance. A lot of the traditional insurance providers have really antiquated, terrible service. There's a whole bunch of companies in this. A lot of them are horizontal companies. We're building something, Hopper Care, to basically do medical. Um, I had a, somebody suggest something to me today to allow somebody to cancel their trip if they break up with their significant other as a reason, which I thought was really cool. We might actually try that. And then you hit the payment and financing. This is actually the most crowded space. You have a lot of big horizontal players like Affirm and others um, that quite frankly are doing some really dubious stuff with venture money right now. When there's a recession, we'll see how this goes. I'm sure a lot of them are gonna do well. Um, we have price freeze up here. It's not a typo. So 20% of our users use price freeze as a buy now, pay later, because when you freeze, we credit to the price of the booking. It's basically free, but you're not committed to buying. So it's actually a better version of buy now, pay later. It's one of the reasons it's so popular. We have our own in-app currency, um, 
obviously it had to be called a caret. What else could it be? Um, and that basically lets us seamlessly do credit. Um, there's another space that we're super interested in, and this is dominated by the Asian companies where credit card penetration was super low. Grab is a great example. Um, it's basically to have a digital currency with a wallet where you can you know, commit to it, debit from it. Um, a bunch of companies in Asia dominate this from Alibaba to C-Trip. That weird pig is actually Fliggy, which is Alibaba's travel uh, company, second largest OTA in China. Um, and we think there's infinite upside around that. And you know, as a Western company, we should be ashamed that we haven't actually done more in that area. So that's the general fintech space. So what about the upside? Well, what we learned is that customers want to buy this stuff. Actually, um, what you're seeing there is the attach rate. 56% of our customers buy at least one fintech. We have it on hotels now. Our attach rate is actually 70, 70 when you count hotels. And customers that buy this actually buy 1.7 per transaction, so more than one on average. We have the full portfolio. The, the, the lines you're seeing is the, us building up the portfolio. And these attach rates, which is what you're seeing there, are stable. What's interesting is what you don't see on this chart is a whole bunch of people buying this because they're freaked out of COVID and then the attach rate's crashing. You can actually see that post-COVID, they're better, which means this is not just a fear and loathing thing because of the pandemic. It's actually structural. Consumers want to be able to buy their way out of risk, annoyances, fear, and all sorts of bad things. And it's our job, I believe, to provide that certainty. Let's talk about the economics here. So this is probably the only interesting thing about my company, if I boil it down to this, which is that what we've done sort of accidentally is we have created new customer spend. So you go back to the day where Travelocity sold the first ticket online, the average order value adjusted for inflation is about 350. For 20-something years, we've been fighting over that customer spend because all the money comes from there. So Steve starts Kayak. You know, the other Steve starts TripAdvisor. He becomes 5% of my reach at Expedia. I give him some money. Google buys ITA. We give them some money. But we're all squabbling over the same pie. When we introduced the FinTech products, without knowing this, um, we actually created new customer spend. It's about 12%, which means that to buy the same travel stuff that they would buy on another website, when customers come to Hopper, they drop an extra $42 for air and an extra $25 for hotels. We're, yes, we're doing this in car. We'll see what that does. And the hotel stuff is not even a year old, so I think it's going to arise at about the same thing, about $40 there too. So how big is the opportunity? So if you're sitting in the space saying, yes, I would like more money, please, um, this is what it looks like. This is uh, the focus right number. They are forecasting global travel recovered at 1.4 trillion. And you have the usual breakdown, supplier direct, 400 and something billion. Um, so I apologize if you're not from the US. I have a very US-centric set of logos here. But you have your usual suspects here, all the big chains, hotels. OTAs and Metas, so this is where we compete. That's actually a pretty small segment. Offline and corporate, this is the land of the three-letter companies, like the BCDs and uh, uh, GBTs. Um, that's actually the largest segment. We rarely, it's like, not cool, let's not talk about that, but actually there's more volume there than all the other segments. And I'm putting loyalty there as a wink to our friends at Capital One, but it's actually a really interesting segment that there's a lot of competition. It's actually growing. So this whole thing's 1.4 trillion. If you take my 12% extra customer spend and you apply it to every segment, assuming it's all the same, which it's not, that's a stupid assumption, but humor me, um, you get a total unrealized customer spend, and unrealized because we haven't built these products, of $168 billion at the current product set that we have. So let's do some bunny science. I will show you how to build your own FinTent stack in three easy steps. So you collect trillions of flight prices for 10 years, which is what we've been doing. So we've been streaming all the GDS traffic and some other things. Then you need billions of user events. Everything everybody taps on, you need to collect that. This is an example for New York to London. Um, if you're shopping that route and you're trying to buy FinTech, we're pricing off of 11 billion historic prices and 175 million user sessions that we've accumulated. And then you need to dynamically price all of your fintech using machine learning. So 
the point here is that it's actually pretty easy to put a bunny that says, do you want to you know, cancel for any reason in the, in the app? Um, it's very hard not to blow your face off and lose money. So the only reason we're able to make money on this is because every single product is priced dynamically. Think of it as because we know the future of what the price is going to do, and we can guess at the future of what you're going to do as a customer, we're able to decide how much we will charge you to join the risk pool. Because when we get these things wrong, we, we pay out hundreds, thousands of dollars sometimes. So this chart with the squiggly lines, as you're seeing just raw data science, our engines are constantly optimizing. We develop a new model. The data scientists throw it into this bucket, and it's basically a gladiator pit fight. Whatever model is generating more revenue becomes the champion, and there's more challengers that are put in all the time. We've been doing this for five years. That's pretty much the only way to take on all this crazy risk. But when you do, you have a very profitable business. So if you're sitting there thinking, wow, that's flipping crazy. There's no way we could do that. Um, you are in luck. Um, in January of this year, we made all of our products available. We call this Hopper Cloud. So everything I've been talking about from the price freeze, the disruption, it's all available. We connect to the system um, that you're running. Um, we will help you integrate. Um, we take on all of the risk on our PL, so you don't actually have any of that uh, to carry forward. Um, and it's free, and all you have to do is take the money that we give you. So it's a pretty easy value prop. So I will end on that. Same shameless self promotion. Thank you very much. And now, please welcome to the stage the interviewer for this session, Mitra Sorrels, a senior reporter at Focuswire. Well, good, good to see, see you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great to see you. Good to great see you. to see everyone finally again back this together. This is awesome. It's so weird. I can see your legs. Yeah, <laughs> lots of Zoom calls together, right? So, you know, we have spoken many times over the years. I've written many stories about Hopper, and in general, it has been described as a consumer travel app. Certainly, in the last couple of years, we've said with the addition of the fintech products, with now the Hopper Cloud. But as I'm listening to you, I'm standing backstage listening to you with these uh, slides and thinking about all your signage around the facility, um, I, I can't help but wonder, and I have to believe maybe some in the audience are wondering if for our future coverage, the description has to change to Hopper is a B2B provider of travel fintech that also has this consumer travel app. I yeah. mean, is that, is that fair to say? Nobody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, the, the first thing is the, our, our app business, so the marketplace, is up 15-fold, so from our pre-pandemic levels. The growth there has been extraordinary. Um, and the reason is what I was explaining. It's because we're, we have all these new bespoke products that are leading to customer activation, and we're doing things very differently. Um, and we view that as our innovation furnace to try the fintech. So before we go and convince a bank to use our stuff, it's better that we know it works, right, as a basic principle. So we use a lot of that um, to do it. And we're actually expanding the app presence. So we have teams in Asia, Latin America, Europe. We're buying small companies and turning them into our, our, our first wave, our seed for these markets. But what I explained fundamentally is when we realized we were increasing the market share and that kind of donut I was showing, you know, we're, we, we're battling in a $300 billion category as, a, as a, an aggregator. And, you know, you could say that's a big town, but I don't know, Shopify's is bigger. And so, honestly, when we were looking at this at the end of 2020, we're like, wow, we just need to make this available everywhere. And that is the totality of the strategic thinking that went into it. Okay. So that leads me to ask, though, if you really see a strong future for the consumer travel app, wouldn't you want to keep all of this for yourself? There's no reason to because there's nothing that we can do that's going to make the other OTAs go away or Google give up on travel. There may be some people that wish I could, but like I can't make that happen. So like travel will be fragmented forever for a lot of valid reasons over time. And so the idea that you, you need to like hoard all this stuff is ridiculous. And at Hopper, one of the reasons we, we, we've been able to get so much product market fit on so many products is we just... We talk to our customers and like, what do you need? What do you want? And what we're finding is that, look, about a third of the, the, the category will always book direct for good reasons. And so why can't we make price freeze available to them full stop? And that's, we always think in very simplistic terms, what is right for the customer? The rest, the growth, the money, that will all come after that. And can you just tick off for me again? So right now you have Make My Trip. 
uh, in terms of the, the customers? Yeah, so the, Capital One's announced. Yes. We're also doing Kayak, so that, that got announced. And we have about half a dozen more coming out, which I can't like literally like put out the names because they're not live yet, but you'll get those as we, as we go. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, so let's also talk, you know, you've been fairly vocal about your super app ambitions. Um, I think I've heard you use the word obsessed with the yes, idea that and that it is an arms race to become the launch point for intent. So how do you get there? So fundamentally, the reason I believe this is going to happen, and I'm willing to wait another 10 years to, to be right about this, is that it comes down to a very simple thing. On a website, if somebody's using a desktop or something, they will browse an average of 34 websites. This is a focus right number before to book a full trip, right? They'll swap between tabs. Swapping between 34 apps that do the same thing is a mental illness. Like nobody would ever do that. Like it doesn't make any sense. And so what you're seeing is if you peel out the mobile web from the statistics right. and you look at app, the people that are gaining the most share naturally are the aggregators, Skyscanner, Kayak, Expedia's brands, and the broader the better, and we're winning a ton of share. We're 5% of all you know, OTA air in, in the US, up from 1% pre-pandemic. And so it's because, especially the younger generation, but as people adopt the phones, you want your start point to be an app. So finally, this whole Google owns all of the intent is going away. If you go to Asia, where you have a very different environment, so right. people don't know this, but the, the Chinese apps look so weird. It's because most users do not know the characters. They don't know the character for like hotel refund. Think of how the Chinese language works. So they're super loaded with images and things that say click here. But one of the effects of that is very early on, people started referring to these apps as, I'm gonna understand how to navigate the category that I'm in. And so we think that fundamentally the future is people will pull out one app that they trust and everything will start there. And I would argue that Amazon has proven this. Their actual intent, the number of product searches in Amazon has surpassed Google, and their advertising revenue is larger than Facebook's as of this year. So do they have the best chance of, of becoming that? Amazon has been strangely skittish in travel. Like, it just crossed Puget Sound. It's not that hard. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't get it. <laughs> but there's probably a lot of good reasons. Um, fundamentally, um, I think Alibaba has a good chance. I think Ctrip has. So basically, apps that are coming in. You have Grab that's looking at travel. I think Ola's interesting. Um, it's I, I just don't think that as Western companies, we fully understand the power of what's happening. My favorite app right now is Pinduoduo. I'm obsessed yeah. with that too. So I, I did this at another conference uh, that you know, rhymes with Swift. Raise your hand in the audience if you know what Pinduoduo is. Okay, let the record show there's like five hands. It's <laughs> if there was zero. So this is the largest e-commerce company in um, China, it's actually not Alibaba, and they grew to $5 billion of revenue in four years. And they did it through social commerce and a super app. We're trying to reverse engineer as much as we can um, from that thesis. And, and that digital wallet piece yes. that you have, that's a big piece of that? It's huge. Well, there's a lot of things that happen. So uh, Grab is, is, is amazing. Um, like about this because they actually are a payment company. When you have a wallet, a couple of things happen. One is there's no fraud because you're on both sides of the transaction. So the cost of doing the commerce goes down. Second, you can mix your reward system. And then the third thing, and this is a hopper stat, it may be different, but 70% of our customers say that they have a separate saving accounts for travel. So we're younger, we're more than 50% debit card. We have a, a younger demo that doesn't have the credit access, but 70% of our customers are saving. Um, and they're getting almost no returns on the savings account. So you think of what uh, Jack Ma did with Ant. Like, there's unbelievable upside in helping people like pay for finance travel that we haven't even touched in the West right now. You know, you just made the comment about your younger demo. I've heard you say that Kayak and Expedia is what people's parents use, and Hopper is what. That's what our customers tell us. Yeah, yeah. my dad. My dad uses. <laughs> <laughs> my dad uses those things. Yeah. So we are. Um, we have a higher uh, millennial and Gen Z concentration than Airbnb, so we're about 78% uh, under 40 in our, in our demo. Millennials are getting old. They're not 27 anymore, and if you pay uh, attention to that. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I listened to you uh, just spoke at WIT Experience Singapore virtually with my colleague, Sue Hoon. Um, I heard a couple things there. I heard you mention that one of the reasons you left Expedia to start Hopper in 06 was because Expedia was not 
innovating enough. Those are your words. Um, and then in that same interview, you also mentioned that around 20, late 2018, 2019, Hopper was really not making any money, which kind of put you in survival mode and led to some innovation. Um, I'm curious, those comments to me indicate that you see sort of an inverse correlation between stability and dominance on the one side and innovation and creativity on the other. Is, is that a fair assessment? I mean, yes. And I actually think, you know, when we looked at 2017, Dakota Smith, who basically runs Hopper, uh, came to me and said, I have a spreadsheet that proves that we're going to run out of human beings. So he had run a model for real. And with the amount of gross profit we were making, he's like, before we make a billion dollars like Uber, there will not be enough humans. We're going to have to find aliens to buy our product. And we're like, because we were selling air only, right? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I can see how that's a problem. Right? And so the fact that we were making no money is why we were forced to become so innovative. Yeah. And, you know, we did crazy things. We still do. But like when the pandemic hit, I had more risk in the market on my PL than I had cash. We were sitting there going, wow, by Friday it's over after 12 years. And the reason we were so crazy about that, at finding product market fit, is because we had no choice. Now I'm struggling to keep that spirit in the app, but I, I believe that if you become large enough and dominant enough, you have the perils of incumbency, I think Darren yeah. used to call this, where you just sit on the empire and you collect rent. And history has shown that if you do that, there's going to be a disruptor that's going to come in and eat your lunch. So right now, one of the things we're doing, you know, as we get into the thousands of employees is like, keep that day one mentality, um, that obsessive day one mentality, we come up with the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I was going to ask, is how you keep that innovative spirit going. So I guess it's There's a couple of things. conscious um, effort. We run a different model called single-threaded ownership. So we literally have no functions, no CTO, no CRO, no CMO. Everything is a small unit of no more than 12 people with somebody who has full hire and fire over all the engineers, the designers, and we prohibit people from talking to each other. Like we've actually kicked down doors and said, this is an illegal meeting. You can't hold it. Like I'm not joking in the beginning. <laughs> and so by doing this, it sounds like pandemonium. And this is actually invented at Amazon. This is actually Jeff Bezos came up with this. And it's necessary in travel because you got to be good at so many different things and keep velocity everywhere. And so think of it as a loose federation of startups that are using a common brand, common platform, common security. So the only function as Hopper are security, um, and finance. That's it. We don't even have okay. HR. That's distributed. Okay. So if you keep teams small and you say, make money, find customers, the same way a startup does, you actually end up with a lot of velocity. You get some pandemonium, like quite a bit, but the speed and the customer focus in a small team, in our opinion, outweighs some of the chaotic stuff that you have to do. Example, <laughs> at Hopper, anybody can ship anything into the app without any authorization. Not to 100% of users, but I could literally start a shrimp, a frozen shrimp business on the side and ship in the app. Wow. It wouldn't go very well, but like you, you could actually <laughs> technically do that. That's super interesting, actually. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, just a couple questions as we're starting to get a little bit tight on time. I know that you had told me that pre-pandemic, you had a team working on business travel. Yep. And then, of course, the pandemic hit travel shut down, um, and you pivoted them, and that's what really accelerated your fintech products. Will you revisit business travel? Oh, yeah. I, I know you think very highly of Ariel Co Cohen, yes, who I'm talking to tomorrow. Any chance of partnerships with any we're, companies? We're, we're obsessed with uh, a very simple concept around business, which I think has been tried but not properly, is you book your business travel, you earn the carrots, and then you can use them personally. Uh -huh. And you can use them at Starbucks. You, and this sounds silly, but it's the foundation of the wallet. We just think that because we've been fighting some amazing companies like Booking and Expedia on price parity, we don't mark our prices up. For example, in the Capital One portal, we're not marking up. It's all like raw retail, private rates. Everything is actually cheap. So it's not because you're paying with points. We should charge you more. We think that we can bring that to the business space with the crossover of like, just earn your carrots the same way you, know, you earn the, the grab money in that part of the world, and then use it on your personal travel. So on Hopper, for Hopper employees, we've been testing this because we use our own stuff, obviously. And like, when the carrot system went down, our Slack thing went crazy. Like, I haven't earned my carrots, <laughs> goddammit. Like, so it's, it's, it's funny that that use case has not been nailed after three decades. It's just such an obvious thing to solve. So yes, maybe in partnership, say hi to Ariel for me. Like, we love what they're doing. Yes. But there's just something about that problem that we're obsessed with. Okay. Um, 
final question for you. I know that you know you've raised five hundred eighty-five million dollars. Six hundred. Six hundred. Yeah. Okay. You have said I've heard you say no IPO plans anytime soon. Certainly, two pros and two cons to staying private. Um, so. The pros is you can do whatever you want and get away with it most of the time, right? Like, you have a lot less people to, to go and explain what you did wrong to. Um, look, the only reason I think personally to go public is that you access a much wider capital pool, right? And sure, like, we're not at a point where we're trying to flip this quickly. I think we've proven this by, you know, holding on it for 15 years. And so we think we're in the second decade of a 30-year plan, and we will list as a, a public company when it makes sense to do that, when that, the, having access to that capital pool makes sense. We have great investors that are patient, and so right now we're 100% focused on execution of the app in the cloud. You have a lot on that to-do list, too, oh, yes, I we see. Do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Lalonde. Thank you.